Everything that I do is driven by a need to redeem myself with an obligation to give back to our society. It all started when the metal door slammed shut onto the cell and sent shivers down my spine. The chamber was cold and it smelled of stale air. You know, there's something about a door slamming shut that provides an eerie level of finality, and reflection. You hear the echo of it in your mind for a long time to come. And as that door slammed, I started remembering all the advice that my parents, my teachers gave me, and I ignored it. And there I was with plenty of time to reflect on all that information that I met with, disbelief, laughter, and scorn. June 24th, 1992, I made mistakes that I couldn't fix. After a long night of being violent, I ended it with beating a man, taking his wallet, and then trying to run him over with a car. And that's how, at age 17, that I was arrested, charged, and convicted as an adult. At an age where most kids are thinking about their high school prom, or they're thinking about who they're going to vote for next, I was facing 11 years. And while facing those 11 years, again, I had plenty of time to think about all my decisions. So after being sentenced to prison for 11 years, it took, well, you may think it took a lot of of all the information that I did receive that somehow that would get to me, somehow it would get through to me, but it didn't. And then I was finally sentenced to prison where I met some of the most interesting people you'll ever meet. (laughs) I met a man who, who ate mice, rats, and bugs. This man was also serving a life sentence for trying to skin another man after a drug deal went bad. I watched grown men melt into puddles of insanity as they, their minds could no longer take the conditions of the monotony of being in solitary confinement. I watched massive amounts of violence that included guards, beating prisoners, prisoners being stabbed, and all this before I turned 18. And again, you would think that with that information and what I saw, what I experienced, that that would get through to me, but it actually wasn't. It was actually one of the most unlikeliest people and one of the most unlikeliest of places that finally did get through to me. And it's a man who I'll always be grateful to, and his name was Alameen. In our conversations, he would tell me that his cell was actually his tomb, and that's how he would call it. He would say, this is my tomb, this is where I'm living at. You see, he was serving two life sentences. And when there were disturbances or things going on, the guards always wanted to make sure they knew where he was 
because they knew he was a man with no reservations about what he might do. So as we served our time together, he started teaching me a little bit about the strategy of chess. And eventually, I started to understand about how to look at chess in a whole nother light. And we were both in solitary confinement, but through the, the clutter, through the dirty floors, through the constant banging and yelling, I would get down on the floor and yell my chest moves through the vent and he would yell his. And through those chest moves, he would always make sure that he would take time to execute them with another lesson. And some of those lessons that I started thinking about was in that cell, in that dirty, sometimes toilet flooded cell. I started to practice virtues in life. And some of those virtues that I started practicing was simple, but yet profound. And it all tied into chess through those many years of laying on the floor and playing this game. One, first lesson, respect all of everybody, no matter what their differences. And looking at the chessboard, respect each individual piece and understand that each square they're in is an important square. Two, to protect the weak. You may look at the pawn, and it may appear as though at the beginning of the game it is the weakest piece, but it actually has the most potential than any other piece on the board to actually become the most powerful piece. And three, to be humble. Play the game as if every move counts. And that's how you make decisions in life. Don't take it as a given. And lastly, practice restraint. When playing the game, do not chase pieces. Play the game to win. We used to play 10, 20, 30, 40 games of chess. And tied in there, I learned the art of losing because I lost a lot of games. But through our many conversations, interactions, and, 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 and just ability to communicate, I realized that my redemption was going to be obtained through education, perseverance, and helping others out. So I began to read. I read a lot. I read everything from Plato to Nietzsche to um, Machiavelli to... Carl von Clausewitz, I read everything. But you may be surprised, but some of the most accessible books to prisoners are law books. They're heavy. They're really sturdy. Not only do they make good weights, but I also, through reading those law books and understanding them a little bit better, realized I could fight battles without ever having to pick up a sword. But I knew that I had to make sure, and I wanted to make sure that once I was released, I was to never return again. But in order to do that, when I did get out, I needed to make sure that I educated myself much further. Well, thank goodness for fast food restaurants, because the fast food industry does hire felons. And so when I got out, I started working at Taco Bell, And I also enrolled in the local community college. And in that local community college, I I started there. And and eventually, two, three colleges later, five years later, I eventually graduated with my bachelor's of paralegal studies. But... (laughs) 
So after I graduated, because of my volunteerism and because of the fact that I did obtain a much more formal education, I was granted permission by the state of Iowa to actually work in a facility with juveniles, actually at the same facility where I spent time as a juvenile. And currently, I supervise over 50 employees. That includes caseworkers, that includes program supervisors, and residential counselors and nighttime workers. I also provide crisis intervention to our local police department, hospitals, and I also work part-time at our local juvenile detention center. I was a guest there too. So, but that's, I feel as though I'm making a difference, but that's not really enough for me. Not at all. What I need to do, and what I knew I needed to do in order to affect real change and in order to affect real, any type of policy change on a local, state, and federal level, I knew that I needed to further my education even more than that. So I eventually did receive a master's degree in criminal justice, and I'm very close to receiving a PhD in criminal justice. So when I'm looking at how do we work with kids in the system, we have to examine everything that gets them where they're at. We have to examine the trauma that a lot of these kids have experienced. We have to then introduce trauma-informed care. Now, that's a philosophy. If you take anything from what I've said, I want you to take this. When you look at these kids, when you look at them, even the adults, these young adults, I want you to look at them, and instead of saying what's wrong with you, I want you to say what happened to you. That is the lens that will allow you to sort of look at these people in a different manner. So then as these pawns eventually go through the game, they can become one of the most powerful pieces as well. So currently, as I mentioned, I'm... I'm I'm working in this, in this field. Um, this is something that is important to me. But if I could change four things to help facilitate the habilitation of these juveniles, I want to list those out. Now, notice I said habilitation. It wasn't a mispronunciation. Habilitation is what I say because we can't, really say rehabilitation because that assumes that you have to be able to go back to what you were. And a lot of these kids were not there. So how can you rehabilitate someone who was never habilitated to begin with? You can't. The first thing that I believe that we need to take a look at is, and we need to focus on when looking at reforming the juvenile justice system is, one, we need to look at the individual we got to understand what, what got him or her there, especially if they're at a young age. One thing I want you guys to realize is that this, what I'm, what I'm talking about, what I'm speaking on, isn't just by my experience that's making me say this, but this is what science says. The adolescent brain doesn't fully form until age 25. The frontal lobe is still not connected at all. So what you have then is you have someone telling these kids, don't do this, don't do this, not understanding that in addition to the frontal lobe not being connected, you also have someone who's probably had multiple amounts of trauma, violence in their life that they witnessed. So they really, and that affects the brain on another level in the way that it sees, hears, feels, thinks, and perceives situations. So we need to focus on the individual, and that will be my first, that's the first thing I want us to look at. The second thing is we need to actually engage the family. The family needs supportive services put in there as well, because a lot of times we work on the child, but we don't work on the family. So you send the child back to the family, and we're right back where we started, right? Right? Is that habilitation? That's rehabilitation there then, right? 
That's not what we want, not that type of rehabilitation. So we have to work with them synonymous at the same time. You have to work with the family, you have to work with the child, and you have to create a family interaction plan that will allow them to go back, the child with the right tools and the family with the right pieces of services placed in there to support them and what's going on in their lives and their individual diverse situations, whatever those might be. Third, I want us to really, and this is probably one of the more personal things for me, is that um, we cannot allow juveniles to be with adults in prison settings. I, I have to tell you that when I first went to the Iowa State Penitentiary, there was 550 prisoners there. I was the youngest for at least a year, and I was still 17. The neighbor to my right, when I walked in and I, and I go to the, 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 the lines of sales, I go to a cell. My neighbor to the right, his name is Shank, and he's doing a life sentence. Neighbor to my left, he's doing a life sentence, and he just shanked somebody. So what we got then is this is who's influencing our kids when we put them in there. And then it's, my first cellmate was a 50-year-old man who was in there for second-degree murder. And I'm 17. Again, you know, he had the whole thing going on from the three-time loser on his arms to the, you know, everything going on. So that was my roommate. That was my cellmate. So we cannot continue to house juveniles and adults together. That is, that's wrong. And lastly... The thing I want to, the other point I want to make, the fourth one is that we, we need to, we've talked about the individual, we've talked about the family, we've talked about, well, they've done something, where do we put them at? But then they also got to go back to the community, right? Because that's what sort of shapes everybody as you're growing up is the community. So we need to reestablish community connections. Those community connections have to involve job opportunities, they have to involve uh, the ability to complete education, school, because school was one of my saviors. And they also have to be able to engage in community service. Everybody here has a choice, and that choice is simple. You can either continue to invest in prisons, and we do a lot, don't we? We invest in a lot of prisons. Or we can invest in our children. Thank you.